that understand they're going to look at you and lie their ass off. <laughs> oh yeah, they're going to say you did a great job, but during the you're getting you're at least on my experience you were catching criticism, or they didn't like this, or that was good, but they rarely said really good job by that prosecutor bringing that out or doing that. It was all relatively negative on everyone except the participants in my experience. Well, one thing that did impress me about the other members on the, on the panel is that they, they did abide by the court's instructions about the defendant not taking the witness stand and not talking. There was, they, they didn't seem to hold against, that was, that was not a problem in, in my jury. Uh, they just thought that, in fact, they just kind of thought that that was the norm that the, the defendant doesn't testify. So a lot of the focus obviously was on the complainant and her complaints and why these, you know, why this couldn't have been resolved in some other manner. I got one more thing. They were hired on habitual status in my case. Um, no one ever brought it up, although a lot of people were thinking about his history. And that surprised me. Um, they never comment on my guy not testifying with guilt. You know, I cannot remember a single time, maybe once, where they wanted to briefly talk about evidence or one person did. But the defendant's rights were completely preserved over a week's time, and I, that surprised me. I got the impression that they didn't like to be watched. Um, just two people said that. You know, uh, stuff that's going on and you want to get over and look and see if these people are paying attention, they would look it back, you know, I would look back from time to time, and, and there were people who did not like being watched. Um, they do check your professionalism. I mean, they, they, it was four days of talking about, you know, what's going on in the courtroom. We know we can't talk about the evidence. I mean, we spent a lot of time talking about that stuff. I didn't say a word. The, the jurors are very big on decorum. You know, once you're having to sit there and watch it, you expect everybody to take it seriously. It's, it was kind of counterintuitive because at the same time we felt like it was somewhat of a trivial matter but because we had to be there and we was taking up our time then everybody needed to play it straight and and let uh, me let me comment on something you just said right there about what they're watching and this is more of an experience as a defense attorney years ago charles thompson and i rebecca phillips tried a ag sexual assault of a child as defense attorneys tina and sorry was the prosecutor and devin anderson was the judge I, uh, if anyone knows me, I don't own a suit. I don't know how to dress. I'm, I'm dressed for federal court right now. This is about as good as it gets. Um, I've had two defendants give me ties because they thought I should wear a tie when I go to court. I've probably been in an argument with every single judge in the courthouse about how I dress, except Max Spadden because I'm not an idiot. Um, so when we tried this case and the jurors were coming in and being seated, and there were 80, probably 80, 70, 80 people, I had my red wings, my khakis, my jacket had paint on it, I still remember, on the back. I was definitely not dressed the lawyer part. Now, the defendant had a suit on, Rebecca had a suit on, Charles had a suit on. And as every single person sat down, knowing it was a felony court, I got these looks, wondering what I had done. <laughs> every single one. And when the, when the information eventually popped up on a screen that said someone had raped a child, I got people looking straight through me. I had people sending me to TDC. This is before we started. Every single one of them. And when Devin, when Judge Anderson introduced us as me as a defense attorney and the defendant as the defendant, there was a lot of confusion. I don't know how long that confusion <laughs> lasted during the trial, but they'd made their minds up. They convicted me and they had to change it and it was screwed up for them. I know it was. I know. <laughs> You know, it was a strange trial and a strange result. But anyway, it, that was just, that wasn't my jury experience. It was just well, a, you want to leave into that? Sure, I can do that. We'll have time for some questions. Mine was more a comedic trial. It was more about uh, the defense attorney. So I show up in Analia Wilkinson's court, Judge Wilkinson's court. The prosecutor, it's a marijuana case. This is probably seven or eight years ago. The prosecutor, was either a four or a three. It was the bottom of the rung in the, uh, in the court. I had got screwed on a plea the day before. 
and it was the same prosecutors. I'm like, there's no way I'm going to get, you know, they know I was annoyed about the plea. There's no way I'm going to get paid for this. I'm a def I've been a prosecutor. I'm a defense attorney. It's not going to happen. I'm wearing flip-flops. I'm wearing jeans. I've got a T-shirt, and I've got a gun magazine because that's what I had in my car, and I was going to read my gun magazine. No one's going to pick me. The thing I didn't take into account is Rayford Carter was the defense attorney. <laughs> <coughs> so, so in a way, this becomes a story about Rayford, who, who bless his soul, you know, I, I loved Rayford, but I was juror six or seven. It's not going to happen. I know it's not. I get called to the bench, and the judge says to me, Peter, can you be fair? I'm like, yeah, I can be fair. I mean, you know, I, I'll, I'll be a great juror. I get picked. <laughs> I walk past the prosecutor on the way to the jury box. I probably shouldn't have admit this on video. And under my breath, loud enough that they could hear, I said, you screwed me yesterday. I'm going to get you back in about three hours. <laughs> now we've got two chiefs that appear out of nowhere. We've got a lot of people watching this trial. And what happened is we had two young guys on their way to Kappa Beach party. They're driving through Bel Air. Bel Air pulls them over because the tint on the window is too dark. Now, in fairness, they do bring a tint meter, and it's limo tint, and it's, it's off the scale. They pull the guys out of the vehicle. The driver's got warrants. They put them in the back of the patrol car. The passenger, they ask for a driver's license, and he said, I don't have one. And uh, so he gave his name. They ran him, and they said he's, he's fine. There was no other way to check him out. They weren't going to aphis him. And uh, they say he's free to go. This guy takes off. He would have made a he would have made Hussein Bolt look like he was slow. <laughs> he ran straight down Bel Air and you could see him disappearing off into the 610 and didn't slow down. And Bel Air police were mic'd, and you hear one of them go, I think we missed something. <laughs> <laughs> so, <coughs> so back they go, get the get the defendant who's on trial out of the back of the police car, and there's some marijuana laying on the back seat. And they say to him, hey, you got any pot? And he says, um, yeah, no. He doesn't really, he's kind of uncertain about. So they search the car. And in the trunk, in a pair of white Nike tennis shoes, there's four ounces of, four ounces of marijuana. Now, one, you know, one reason you don't want to put a defense attorney on the panel, I guess, as a defense attorney, is from the offense date to when we in trial is 14 months. We in court nine. There's no way it's 14 months from offense date to trial. And you're sitting with four ounces of marijuana. So it was pretty, pretty sure it was a felony refile. Um, at least that was my thought. And, and, and I was right about it. But you know, I'm sitting and trying to keep myself in check, knowing that this was a more serious case, got refiled as a misdemeanor. We don't know about this. But it's going to come up at some point, because you know, I'm the lawyer, and people are going to ask me. It, Pat, like you were saying, I was trying to keep my mouth shut about certain things. Well, we go through this trial, and um, state rests. We go back into the jury room, and there was kind of talk about, well, what happens next? Is this where we convict the guy? Do we convict him now? I mean, <laughs> and, and I got to tell you, I mean, I'm like, I'm the one that's, we're going to have a holdout. It's me. There's no way they can, you know, with the guy running off and the marijuana found in the trunk, there's no way they can get there. The state's just not going to make it. Um, one thing about jury selection, Yolanda, you were talking about jury selection a little bit ago. I truly think that the quality of the, like you guys were talking about, the quality of the defense attorney and the prosecutor picking that panel directly relates to the quality of juries you get. Our panel was not the brightest panel, and I'm including myself on that. I mean, I, I don't know how I landed up on that panel, but it was, it's, it was very pack like very herd mentality. If I'd said convict him now, they would have convicted him. If someone else had said it, they probably would have done the same thing. Well, I'm thinking in my mind, there's no way anyone is going to put the defendant on the stand. We go back in, we sit down, and the defendant's in the box. And he's ready to testify. And the prosecutor says to him, you know, was it your marijuana? It was kind of an experienced question. First question, was it your marijuana? And the guy denies it. No, one mind. And what he does over the next minute or two is blame the guy that took off. You know? And th th there was no way to convict this guy based on this. It just wasn't going to happen. Well, so the prosecutor says, can you explain to the, can you tell the jury what clothes you had in the vehicle? And the guy goes, yeah, yeah, sure. I had a, a blue jeans. I had a black jacket, a, a leather jacket in the back. And I had a white pair of Nike. 
and he realizes he's just <laughs> confessed. Well, the brakes go on and there's that, you know, you're about to get in a car wreck, there's that moment of silence, that's probably a second and a half, but it's running a little bit longer. Dead quiet in the court. Everyone kind of looks at the judge quick, looks at the defendant, and the silence is broken, comes from the defense counsel table. There was only one person sitting there. You stupid motherfucker. That's, <laughs> that's all you hear, that's all you hear. And <laughs> I look straight at the bench because maybe they're not going to convict. We're not going to convict him. Maybe we are, but you know what's going to happen to poor Rayford? Rayford was about. I, I think he was about to strangle the guy. He was about. To, yeah. And judge kind of just kind of put her head down and shook her head. And yeah. Anyway, so going from we probably don't have a case. We can't convict this guy. We go back to deliberate. And the first thing they start talking about is actually punishment during deliberation. And, I, 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 <laughs> well, and, and, they, and they want to max him out. They want to give him, it's a class A. They want to put him in jail for a year. And I'm like, uh-uh. We, we, you know, poor guy can get time served. I mean, he's been convicted. You know, time served, you're not going to, you, know, you don't want to be on probation. And Rayford's going to kill me anyway, as it is. <laughs> um, but, you know, the experience is, it, the jurors, collectively, generally, are a pretty smart group of people. They do pick up on a lot. They've just got no guidance back there. They, you know, if there weren't walls, they'd probably walk right out the window, So, you know, some of these things. But I, a quick story, I, I, years ago, we were listening at the door in a DWI trial, prosecutor and I, which is, you can do that, right? Yeah. Um, just don't get caught. Shall we, well, I'm confessing to it now. <laughs> and, <laughs> It was a straightforward DWI. A couple of guys went out to a salsa place and, you know, he got busted driving home. The jurors were sitting and having a discussion about why a male went to a salsa bar with his friends. It led to a discussion of, is the guy gay? And then it led to a discussion of, this goes on for five minutes. Should we cut him a break or treat him differently because the guy's gay because he was a disalsible? And you know, at that point, you know, we, we just we just kind of gave up on it. And, but I don't, you know, it, they talk about every, everything. I mean, we talked about some strange stuff, and ours wasn't a long trial. But it's it's more so the just the. I think I think people are trying to figure out what they are supposed to do. We we as lawyers kind of understand the rules somewhat, but they don't. And you do have a few lawyers on there, and it's sometimes, I mean, I, well, I was one of mine, and so were you guys, but it, it's, hard to, it's hard for them to stay in a straight line, is what it comes down to, at least from my experience. Questions? We have time for one. Yes, they did in our case. No. Oh, go ahead. Start.
I can tell you in our case, they came back. Uh, they were asked to come back. Um, they made no statements. Um, the obvious thing they could have said was, hey, what about the girlfriend? What happened to her? Or they could have offered that up and saying, hey, y'all did the right thing because the girlfriend was going to testify. They walked out, and I went out afterwards and say, forgot to ask the question, uh, what happened with the girlfriend? And that's the only time they told me personally that, that she had pled to a cap of 20 in exchange. So, um, granted, that was just my experience. Uh, Yolanda, you bring up a very pertinent point, in my opinion. Okay. The, 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 this trend some, that you run into sometimes after a trial when the defense has prevailed and the prosecutors right. all in a snit uh, and, and they go back there and they start trying to broadcast to the jury uh, evidence that would be inadmissible. I think it's a, in, imperative on the part of the defense counsel at that point to bow up and I've had to do this on several occasions where they start talking about that to interrupt them and start talking about how that was illegally seized, that was improper, you know full well that it's not admissible, and, and get into it with the prosecutor. Don't just let her poison these people who are liable to be on another panel, you know, next year, and they'll think they'll think there's all this all this evidence against the defendant that's not coming in and they'll start speculating because that's why they're doing it they're trying to poison future panels and i and and i think the 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 antidote to that is when they start doing it to get into it with it with them and the, what will happen then is when you start